ஷேத்தான <laughs> அல்முஸ்தலாம் <laughs> الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الظل وكبره تكبيرا صلى الله عليه وسلم ويت سيب يا امام الزمان I respect the teachers, elders, brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum jami'a wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The next section of the du'a of iftitah, which is given to us by our 12th Imam, our master of our age, Imam al-Hajjah ajjal Allah ta'ala, Faraj al-Sharif. Is one which he begins to discuss the authority and the supreme position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a creator, as an entity, as a God and one that provides us with understanding of leadership and allows us to discuss not only leadership but also an understanding of how our youth can also engage in leadership and grow into the community leadership. The verses at hand state All praise belongs to Allah. Alhamdulillah alladhi lam yattakhir sahibatan wala walada. All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because He has not taken a wife. He has not got a son. There is no one who is an authority for Him or over Him in any part of creation in any way whatsoever. And by virtue of this authority and by virtue of this status as a God, we are obliged to magnify and glorify him in a way which is befitting and therefore when he says that we should glorify and magnify him we respond in a way by magnification which is to perform the takbir to recite allahu akbar at the response of this he continues by saying alhamdulillah alladhi la muzadda lahu fi mulki wa la munaza'a lahu fi amri Indeed, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because there is no opposition to Him in any of His command. And there is no disputer with Him in any of His affair. And also we should praise Him because that there is no partner to Him in His creation and that there is no similitude to Him in His glory. And by virtue of this, These are the reasons why we should recognize his grandiosity and we should have this takbir where we are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This particular sequence of verse is one that can be designated within the four areas of praise that we found at the beginning of Da'a Iftitah. As we said, the first thing that we are to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, we stated for guidance. The second is that we praise him for the mercy that is overflowing and abundant upon us. And then the next for the law within his creation. And the fourth for his superiority over those who have pride, who have arrogance, who seek to be an enemy towards the religion of Islam and thus to religion and humanity altogether. 
By virtue of those four categories, one might suggest that this particular sequencing may fall in the fourth category of the praise. Because for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remain supreme as God, this is the reason why we are praising Him and magnifying Him in this particular manner. There is no partner to Him in creation. There is no opposition to Him in any of His command. And by virtue, He is superior and authoritative over every and all else within creation. When we look at the Holy Quran, we find that the Holy Quran provides us with all of the very best starting arguments. This particular starting line, when we say, Alhamdulillah, الذي لم يتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا, we here removing any potential for partnership to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way, shape or form. Now here this happens at many levels. This happens at the level of discussion with our brothers and sisters in humanity, when we are obliged to remind them that there is one sole God and there is no partnership to Him. But also there is the reality that it must fall within the heart itself. And thus when I believe, not just from tongue, but from my heart and I remove any partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heart, that is when the heart begins to truly glorify and magnify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us look at these two facets. The Quran is one that provides us with the very best of arguments. So now when I am engaged with, for example, Christian brothers or Hindu brothers or Christian sisters or Hindu sisters, we are ones that we are engaged in discussion about the principal concept of Godhood. The idea that there is only one God, there is no wife, there is no son, there is no partner. He does not have a wali in any way, shape or form. He is solely existent in this manner. When I have this discussion, the very best arguments I should be looking to present are the ones based within the Holy Quran itself. For example, in Surah Al-Mu'minun, chapter number 21, verse number 22 of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides us with an outstanding argument for all values when it comes to the concept of Tawheed, Wahdaniyyah, the concept of just oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, had there have been other gods, had there have been any other gods to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this universe would have been in a state of chaos. Had there been any other in creation, had there been a partner, had there been another God in any way, shape or form with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this universe would have been in a state of chaos. Why would he state this particular verse? What aspect of Tawheed is he trying to inculcate within our heart and within our discussions? Imagine now, there were two gods in creation. Let's just imagine that this universe, as vast as it is, when we say vast, we need to come to a context as to how vast it is. They say that some of the furthest stars are 13 trillion light years away from here. Now how do we quantify that really? How do I examine the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I'm unable to qualify what 13 trillion light years really is. But when we really begin to think, it allows us a glimpse into the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now imagine as far and as wide as this physical domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, imagine if there were two gods, two creators in this grand system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What would have happened? How would the world have been different? How would the universe have been different had there have been two creators and sustainers within this particular universe? Let us talk at a very simple level. Imagine now there are youths who are sitting with us, just pick an age, eight years old, five years old, that age where we're still playful. Imagine I called two of the youth from amongst the crowd now, and I both gave them a piece of paper. One stands here on the left hand side of the pulpit, one stands here on the right hand side of the pulpit. I give them both of this a piece of paper, and I say to them, both of you, Make for me a paper aeroplane. I can see some of the adults are also remembering their own childhood now and when they would make these paper airplanes. Imagine I ask these two kids, the two youngsters, make a paper airplane each for me. 
Now you know that there are a hundred different ways to make a paper airplane, right? You may fold it in half and then again and then again and you may tear something at the bottom, you may fold the wings over, one child will try to make it more aerodynamic, one child will try to make it in a different way and so on and so forth. So each child, both of these two children are going to make the paper airplane in their own way as to how they consider the best design for this plane. Now I say to them, brilliant, you've made your design, well done. Now let's see who can throw it the furthest. So we have the group who's sitting in the middle, you're probably going to be hit by the paper airplane. So both these two children, they're standing and I say to them, right, both of you on the countdown, three, two, one, throw the paper airplane. Now you can guarantee that although I'm counting down three, two, one, one of the kids will be more eager and he'll throw it on two. There's a reason why I'm saying this. Also, you will know that both of them, the strength that they will put into the throw will be different. One being five years old will throw it at one pace and another being eight years old may have a greater strength within his arm or 12 years old or 15 years old, he will have a greater strength in his arm so he will try to throw it harder. Another one may say to himself, well, I'm trying to use the air, the wind, the velocity, the aerodynamic nature of my creation. Therefore, it's not about the power I put into it, it's about the height that I put into it. Maybe if I throw the paper airplane higher, it will get further into the crowd. Had Allah, had there have been two creators within this system of the universe, they would have been chaos. The same way, two creators of something so simple as a paper airplane, they would have been two different designs. Not only two different designs, they would have tried to have made the rules their own way. One would try to get a head start and throw it earlier. One would have tried to throw it with more pace, more strength. One would have tried to throw it with more height or more velocity. The point is when you have two creators, they are bound to design things completely differently. They will each think that their design is the best. They will each think that their design is superior towards the other one. Maybe, maybe if one of the children had become frustrated that his didn't go as far as the other, he would have started to argue. The same way, had there had been two gods within the universe, there would have been an argument. The fact is within creation itself, it is absolutely perfect. We as human beings are perfect. The system that we have with spring, summer, winter, autumn is perfect. The rising of the tides in accordance with the moon is perfect. The idea of gravity is perfect. The construction of the stars and the solar systems is perfect. This is indicative, this is an evidence that there can only ever have been one creator. Because had there have been two creators, the human being, we wouldn't be one type of human being. One God would have created you with two arms, Another God would have said, well, my creation will have four arms because it's better. And he would have created his version of human being with four arms, or with four legs or with two heads. Had there been two creators within this universe, there would have been absolute chaos. The fact that there is only one system within this universe, everything is following this one system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proves that there can only ever be one creator throughout the entire universe at any one time. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala argues with his logic. He wants us to realize this. The unfortunate thing is certain atheists use this very same argument to try to disprove the creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, we see that there are certain very famous creators of documentaries for the BBC and they have looked deeply into the creation of system. They have looked at the ant world, they have looked at the bird world, they looked at the seas, every facet of creation on earth. Unfortunately, their argument is the fact that this earth is so perfect, we cannot believe that there is a creator. Our argument is exactly the opposite. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the opening verses of Surah Al-Mulk chapter number 67 of the Holy Quran asks you to recognize the fact that everything is perfect. It must be one sole creator. He says, مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْكِ الرَّحْمَانِ مِنْ تَفَاوَتِ 
فَرْجِعِ الْبَصَرِ هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُطُورِ Have a look at the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look again and again and again. The more you observe the creation of Allah, the more you'll become fatigued. You will not be able to find a fault in His creation. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating this in this du'a. I haven't taken a partner. I haven't taken a son to inherit from me. I haven't got someone to dispute with me. I haven't got a wife that has asked me to perform creation in this way. I am soul. There is none but I in creativeness. There is none but I in authoritiveness. There is none but I and none but I altogether. The fact that you recognize this, magnify me, glorify me in a way which is befitting of a magnification. Hence we respond, Allahu Akbar. Process is understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being aware of His grandiosity, and then the heart becomes overflowing with acceptance. Hence the heart becomes one who can actually glorify and magnify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, we can introspect about our own servitude and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When do we recite takbir most? In tasbihat of Lady Zahra sallallahu alayha, one, two, the most time we recite it during the day, in salah. Allahu Akbar is so consistent within salah. I start my salah with takbiratul ihram. Having finished my position in qiyam, Allahu Akbar, I go into ruku'ah. Having finished, I go back. Finishing my sajda, Allahu Akbar, going back into my sajda. Here we find that there is a consistency taking place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dua is asking us to recognize His oneness. Asking us to be fully aware, annihilated within that oneness. Consider it and then glorify Him. In the same way, before I stand for my salah, take a minute. There's no rush. Stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, clear the mind, become aware of His glorious oneness, having then removed all those thoughts that have come into the heart from the day, then I can stand in front of Allah with takbiratul ahram and say, Allahu Akbar. The more I practice this, the better my qiyam will be. Having then stood in qiyam and recognized that I am standing as one who has been wrong through the day, the one who is standing in front of his master, when I then finish my second surah, I will then go into another takbir. And again, I will have remembered Allah for his absolute oneness. The takbir is supposed to follow this process of having recognized tawheed, then I magnify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not just from the tongue, it is recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, الذي لم يتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ شَيْءٌ مِنَ الْخَالِ Allahu Akbar. And it continues. Alhamdulillah الذي لا مناز له في أمره. All praise belongs to Allah. He is the one who does not take opposition. There is no opposition to him in his kingdom. He does not have any opponent, no, no disputation in any way, shape or form. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who we cannot argue against. There is no one who can stand above or against him and say to him, you have created creation incorrectly. There is none that can stand in front of him and say that we are not pleased, satisfied, we do not agree with how you have done this. This is his level as the creator and sustainer. However, yesterday we stated the tradition from our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa in which he says, تَخَلُّكَ بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ Adopt for yourselves the etiquette, the akhlaq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now in this statement, am I able to apply this? All praise belongs to Allah. He does not have any opponent. He does not have a disputer. He does not have a similitude, he does not have a partner in any of his facets of creation or authority. I can't apply this to myself. 
I can't say that I as a leader, I don't have any disputer with me in authority. I can't say I don't have any partner with me in any way, shape or form. And therefore the opposite in this circumstance comes. I have to recognize in this circumstance, I do have my limitations. Whereas Allah does not, I have my limitations. I as a leader cannot apply these very same attributes to me. Here we go into the construct of what leadership really is. For I cannot level myself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore for I as a leader, or you and I as leaders, we have to recognize the qualities of leadership for within ourselves, and therefore be encourage our youth to take upon these skill sets of leadership within our own time. When it comes to leadership, we would like to introduce, or maybe the word should be reintroduce, one of the most outstanding discussions that we have come across in regards to leadership in our time, in our generation. The reason why I bring this particular topic up is because I would like to encourage my younger brothers and sisters to be aware of one particular leader within our community. His name, Marhum Mullah Azhar. May Allah bless his soul. I would like to bring this particular discussion from the terms of Marhum Mullah Azhar for the sake that definitely my elders will be very much aware of him, his leadership qualities, his own ideals, but therefore, maybe some of my younger brothers have not become so acquainted with Marhum Mullah Azhar. And therefore, I would like my younger brothers and sisters to become aware of what kind of personality we had within our community. Also one that we are trying hard to emulate, but also what kind of ideals he left for us as a particular community. When it came to leadership, a generation back, he was involved in a presentation in World Federation for a concept, an idea for leadership, which was entitled the Code of Leadership. Many of my elders will remember this. Many of our contemporaries may have studied this. He had an idea which he wanted to implement at the very senior level of World Federation. And therefore, if it becomes successful, to filter it down into Jamaat level, whereby the presidents of Jamaat also follow this very same concept. Code of leadership. Google it. It is available from World Federation where you can read the entire transcript of the discussion and what took place upon that very particular day in the World Federation meeting. His idea was that when a leader is appointed as president of World Federation, he should uphold two particular characteristics. One, taqwa. Two, adala. Taqwa we are translating as God consciousness, piety, awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two, adala. They should be just within themselves. Now please hear, do not for a second think I'm getting into a political discussion about any individual, of any organization, of anyone in particular, I am not. It is important that I state that, otherwise we'll be accused, we'll say, why are you speak? No, we're just talking about leadership, so we understand in our time where we can mold ourselves to becoming. The idea was that this should become within World Federation president, and then filter down to all levels of Jamaat as well, so that every Jamaat president also is ascribed to the level of Taqwa and Adala. Now, what is this? Why is this the case? Marhum Allah Azhar himself presented his own arguments as to why this is a necessity within our leadership. Why when we are operating leadership, we must have these two tick boxes, we must have a check box, that whenever we are trying to appoint someone as leadership, we are looking to the very heights of leadership within our community, that they uphold these levels within leadership. These are his words, not my words. Please go and read the code of leadership. He states, Marhum Allah Azhar, he states that he has heard and seen from his own lifetime presidents of communities finishing Jamaat meetings, finishing World Federation meetings, and discussing which casino shall we go to tonight. It's not my words. I'm just presenting them to you. 
He states, this is more than a decade. It's more than a decade ago. He says, I have seen first-hand leadership within our community talking about these ideas. When we finish World Federation meeting, which casino shall we go to? Could you imagine? He states, the reason why we need to have some sort of logical leadership, some sort of logical height of leadership, is to ensure that we are not aiding these sorts of leaders from coming within our communities. We should have something that we recognize our leadership by. It may not be there in Sharia, I agree. But within our own community, we can write something within our constitution. So that when we nominate, we nominate someone who we believe to be the person who is worthy of leadership within our communities. This isn't a game. This isn't a game. This is the work of the Imam. And therefore, this is the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not picking someone because he's my brother-in-law. We're not picking someone because he's my cousin. We're picking someone because he is worthy of leadership within our community. He says that there are different times when we nominate. Either I put myself forward for leadership or I nominate someone. I think you are the best person. I nominate you for leadership. Or when it comes to the Jamaat or when it comes to World Federation or Africa Federation or co we then vote for the person. Each one of these three circumstances, the reason why we need to have a mental awareness of who has taqwa and adala, so that whether I am the one standing up for leadership, whether I'm the one nominating for leadership, or whether I'm the one voting for the leader, I am aware that the person I am putting forward is up to task and he beholds the qualities of taqwa and adala. Because I can be the one nominating. I need to ensure that I am nominating someone who has taqwa and adala. Now here we are not saying that this needs to come in. We're not saying that this needs to be implemented. But it needs to be within the heart at the very least. If I'm going to nominate someone for leadership within the community, I need to be aware that he is the best for it. He can lead on the spiritual level. He can lead on the political level. He can lead on the economic level. He can lead within madrasa. He can bring an end to disputes within the community. I have trust that my leadership is capable of performing these actions. Lest we fall into this debilitating, debilitating circumstance where leadership becomes wrong, where leadership becomes less and less of these qualities. Not everyone is capable of being that leader. Not everyone is capable of being that person. Not everyone should be that person. Bahlul Dana has an outstanding example of this, where he wants to highlight that there are people who are the heights of leadership, and there are other people who should not be gaining certain positions. For example, one day he walks into the palace of Ar Rashid. Palace, as he enters into the courtyard, he sees the pulpit of Rashid. This room was completely empty. He didn't see any guards, didn't see any court jesters, didn't see any of these people. He decided to go up and he sat upon the pulpit. He's sitting there on the pulpit and he's emulating, he's having a little bit of fun, he's making fun of Ar Rashid. There's no one in the room, but he's making a little bit of fun and he's pretending to give out orders. You go and do this, you go and spend this money, you need to be the one who comes and writes this edict. As he's making noise and making fun of the Caliph Ar Rashid, the guards burst through the door. They see that Bahlul is sitting upon the throne, the pulpit of Ar Rashid, making fun of their Caliph. What do they do? They pull Bahlul down, throw him to the floor, and they begin to beat him and beat him and beat him. Bahlul is crying out, wailing in pain for having been beaten. Ar Rashid in the next room hears this commotion. He comes in, he sees that this is Bahlul, someone he knows very well. He tells his guards, stop beating him. This is Bahlul, stop. The guards subsist. They come back and they see that Bahlul is now bleeding. Bahlul is in pain. Bahlul is in anguish. Bahlul is crying. Ar Rashid comes, sits down beside Bahlul. He says to him, Bahlul, there's no need to cry anymore, it's okay. Why are you crying still? The guards have stopped beating you. He says, no, you misunderstand. 
I'm not crying because the guards have beaten me. I'm crying because of for your sake. Why? I sat on the pulpit of the Caliph illegitimately, wrongly for just a few seconds. Look at the punishment I received. You have been sitting illegitimately on the pulpit of true Khilafat for so many years. Imagine how many punishments you are going to get in the next world. He was trying to highlight here, leadership is a huge responsibility. Huge responsibility. You cannot just come and sit on the pulpit of Ahlul Bayt and be the one who is claiming to be giving out these edicts. Leadership is one that grows from within. You raise yourself to being worthy. You are the one who demonstrates being able to lead the community. Indeed, we have wonderful leaders in our community. They should be supported, not pulled down. Sometimes we find a leader within the community, he aspires to be the leader. He is clearly head and shoulders above others, but we don't like him because of his surname. Or maybe I have had a personal dispute with him. Just because I've had a personal dispute with this person, doesn't mean that he's not the right person to lead the community. I may have had a disagreement with him. I may have had a disagreement with many people in my life. Maybe he is right, but I was wrong. Why should I be the one who holds him down just because I am the one who has had a disagreement with this person? We must groom our leadership within the 21st century. We must make our mentorship programs. We should have people who want and aspire to be leaders. We should have people who are enthusiastic within the community. And when we find those enthusiastic youth, we should be grooming them and asking them to come within community service. Here we need to suggest to our youth, humbly suggest to our youth, that all of our youth within this community and every community within the world, whoever receives this message, no matter what age of adolescence you are, no matter what age of teen you are, no matter whether you have finished your university or your work, engage in leadership, engage in servitude for the community. Engage, participate. How many youth are there within this community? Let us just pick a figure for the sake of it. 500, 1000, 2000. What is a youth? Some of my uh, elders will also claim to be a youth at the moment. Indeed, you are all youth. I don't care how gray your hair is, you are all youth indeed. But if you are a youth, if you are 16, 18, 25, 30, 35, participate within the community. The commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has a tradition where he states, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has diversified the aspirations of mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has diversified the aspirations of mankind. He continues, why? Because had every human being the same, every human being been the same, this world would have been too difficult to live within. He continues to explain. If everyone here had been the same, then all of you would have had to do exactly the same things within your family. All of you would have had to produce your own food. All of you would have had to be the doctor. All of you would have had to be the engineer. All of you would have had to be the builder. All of you would have had to be the driver. He says, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his planning, in his thinking, in his goal for the creation of his system, was one that he ordained that human beings are different in every way, shape or form. All of you here are unique. All of you here have a different skill set. Have you ever thought about what skill sets you have? Have you ever thought what you excel in? Just look next to the person. Look next to the person sitting next to you. That person does not have the skill set that you have. And you do not have the skill set that he has. Is that a coincidence? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this in creation because He wanted all of us to be unique 
and all of us to have skill sets whereby we are endowed with abilities to give back to the community in those same ways. If you are someone who is good and a professional accountant, you can give back to the community in your own way. If you are good in sports, imagine how you can give back to your own community. You can bring the youth of different ages. You can teach them to become healthy human beings. You can teach them to have ethics when they play sports. You can teach them to have good intentions when they play sports. If you are someone who is good in IT, you can aid the Jamaat in building on their IT infrastructure. If you are someone who is good in art, you can aid the community in their own way. Every situation, every human has been created so that they can give back towards the community in their own shape and form. Imagine now what skill set you have. Imagine now if we had an upsurge. Let's just pick a number. Let's say of our community, 5% are volunteers. How wonderful a community we have. How many different community exercises take place? We have this sports club, we have this debating, we have this madrasa, we have this school, we have this leadership. Imagine now if overnight we doubled the number of volunteers with the community. Imagine how many more youths can be emboldened. Imagine how many more youths can be given leadership training. Imagine how many more youths can be spent time with for their own system of development. Indeed, we are all very busy. Who here is not busy? Aren't the volunteers busy? Aren't the teachers in the madrasa busy? Aren't our leaders busy? They all give time from within themselves. But imagine how much more our Jamaat can grow economically, politically, as an institute for the future of the next 50 years. If another 10% of our community youth stood up tomorrow and said, I will give back time within the community, the same way the community has put time into me in the first place. This is what it means.